Hi, I'm Daz. Um, on the bench today is a Pi P75 valve radio. This one is from about 53 or 54 and uh, it's a, a three band set with a short wave band. Has volume tuning. Around the side is the wave change switch. Around the left is the uh, tone control. Just looking around the back, the uh, cardboard looks in nice condition. There's an aerial and earth socket. And uh, I don't think this has been used for some while because um, I think you can see <laughs> it has a uh, two pin socket or oh, plug on it, even still, complete with a little vintage uh, adapter, which is quite fascinating. So having a quick look inside what we've got, um, this set is a 5 valve super hat. Um, obviously the 5th valve is the rectifier so there's only 4 amplifying valves. It's using the all first all glass valves with the little pip on, I don't know if you can see that. Um, it's a transformer set, it's got permanent magnet speaker. Interestingly the output transformer is on the chassis not on the speaker which many sets have. This looks like a very interesting little uh, clip here to enable you to pull a chassis out and still have the connector connected, or have the speed connected even. It uses um, these open wound aerials, frame aerials, for long and medium wave. And you've got the aerial socket for your short wave bands. Just a quick look at the valve. The output valve is an EL41. Um, of course there's the UY41 uh, or UL41 should I say version of this valve um, which was in my DAC 90A and I know they're not too reliable so this is obviously a 6.3 volt version so it might be more reliable and may not have any problems but I may consider the EL84 as a replacement I don't know if you can see the little pip which is the locator on the uh, side of the valve if you look at the pins, you'll see they are all continuous. So without that pip, it would be possible to put the valve in the wrong way round. Uh, B A B eight A, if I remember correctly, these valves are. Just having a look at these knobs on the side. Um, there's no retaining screw, so they're sprung. So there was a little bit of a worry, but. Um, I'm wondering if I put my hand in and uh, push against them, they might push out. Right, let's see if I... Oh, there we go. Fine, no problem at all. So, uh, looking at that, what else have we got that's holding it in? So it's the uh, knobs. And, yeah, there's four large screws underneath. So, I think I'll get the chassis out. I think this needs a bit of a blowout, it's uh, got lots of uh, nice cobwebs in residence still. Quick first look at the chassis, I can see that uh, we've got some waxies here, there's two of them. I have a lot of these uh, ceramic-y type capacitors so I'm sure they'd be okay. Several electrolytics, that's the main electrolytic, that's the bypass for the screen grids. And that's the bypass for the cathode of the output valve. Um, I think my first act will be to measure wound components. And just check the transformer measures okay. I'm using the trader sheet, which is number 1135, for those who are following at home. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm just going to do some measurements just to see if the transformer's good. But uh, the outward signs are that there isn't a problem in here. This is described as a transportable set, and indeed it is quite... Um, compact in here and very very difficult to um, work on items you've got resistors round at the bottom here so quite difficult to get at if they are out of value um, it just some, sometimes these resistors can drift I find it seems to depend on uh, the age of them sometimes the uh, more newer resistors of this design tend to drift more so that's a case of just having a look before I proceed I shall check the output transformer as well just to see if the uh, winding's check out okay on that. 
That's a very, very compact set. All the wiring is all PVC, the looks of it, which is good, including the mains cable, this uh, brown cable here. So, um, yeah, that's a good sign so far. I think I also need to get rid of this uh, dust. Um, I currently have a cold and it's uh, not particularly helping on that matter. I'm just completing my checks. Well, that's a good sign when you get a click. Is it going to read? Do I have to go up one? Maybe. Let's see if I can get a connection. About 500 ohms on that one. Just checking the, uh, the mains side of the transformer. It says 70 ohms, so that looks good. Having a look at the secondary, HT secondary, 240, oops, wrong connection, 240, 250, says it should be 245, 230, so that's good. So I think we can sort of proceed on the basis that the transformer is probably okay. Just looking at where we've got waxies, this is the coupling capacitor between the first audio triode and the output pentode and this is a waxy it's no doubt going to be uh, very very leaky um, the problem is when these leak you push the grid positive and it turns the valve on hard and that can be very hard on not only the valve but the output transformer so uh, this definitely needs to be replaced so a few hours spent this afternoon working on this chassis um, now I've got all new electrolytics. I didn't have a can that fitted, so um, I've used two individual ones. There was some more uh, wax capacitors hidden away, um, so these have been replaced. There was also a Hunts that's been replaced. Um, other things of note is the cathode resistor, for the output valve, had risen from 220 ohms up to a kilo ohm so that had to be replaced there's a 4.7 k that had risen considerably and also the one meg for the uh, output valve also and also of course I've replaced the coupling capacitor between it um, I've cleaned all the uh, I've cleaned the volume and tone controls also given the uh, select a switch a clean and put some grease on the ball bearing so that goes round a little bit better just looking at the top of the chassis i've um def i always definitely use a thousand volt rating good quality capacitor on the tone correction because voltage can be quite high there um i've lubricated the ball bearings on the smoothing uh, on the tuning capacitor here I've also cleaned the tuning scale because um, that was quite dusty and gunky and re-greased that so that's a lot better than it was previously so that's moving a little bit better the rubber mounts on the tuning capacitor are very good condition actually they're very subtle so supple so I'm just going to leave those as they are so uh, we're making quite good progress with this so i think the next step will be just to check a few um other little items and then i'll look at uh, bunging it on the isolation transform put a speaker on and just monitor the ht and see what happens okay so i'm just preparing to power up now um i've got a loudspeaker connected i've had the valves out clean the holders valve holders and the valve pins so hopefully they make good connections looking at how dark these uh, lamps look i think the this set's done a little bit of work so variac bulb limiter and isolation transformer are all in so i'm going to gradually bring this up and uh, monitor the ht voltage and just see what happens so i'm just going to bring it up to 30 percent i can see immediately one of the lamps is not functional and it's not because it's loose it looks like that has that one has burnt out 
So I'm going to gradually bring it up. There wasn't any problems across the HT, it seemed clear. So I'm just going to gradually bring it up now um, and see what happens. Well, I'm up to near enough 225 volts now and it's just sprung to life. But I was quite surprised how high a voltage I had to get before it sprung to life. And, and basically the volume's at full power and the audio is exceedingly low. Um, so I think the next thing I might do is just check some voltages elsewhere and check how much current is flowing through the audio output tube. Although it works, as I said, it took a very long time before it came into operation. Usually the uh, oscillator I find is the last thing to come into operation, but uh, yeah, okay. So at least it produces sound, so uh, let's see what we can find that's wrong. Of course. I am um, unable to test the valves because my valve tester doesn't work at the moment, but uh, we'll see if we can test the valves in the circuit. Okay, so I'm just testing the uh, voltage across the cathode of the uh, valve. I measured its resistance first and then it, I realised what I'd done. Right colours, wrong order. Oops. So now I have got a 220 ohm resistor in. Uh, the cathode voltage is supposed to be about 5.5 volts, so the valve is working okay. Um, it goes much louder now, but it still seems weak, so I'm actually wondering whether I'm getting sufficient drive to the valve, because when I turn the volume up full, the cathode vo voltage is only moving slightly. Normally you can push it hard enough to make the voltage wobble quite a bit if you're clipping, so... I'm going to continue looking at the voltages and just see if I can spot anything obvious. But it just seems that the reception is a bit weaker than I'd expect from a set like this. A little interesting test to see how bad my valves are. I've turned the DC, uh, sorry, the AC voltage down to about 190 volts, giving us a heater voltage of 5 volts. And there's only 2 volts across the cathode now. And the HT, which is out of shot, has dropped to 92 volts. So that's suggesting to me that the emission of these valves is pretty poor so I'll switch it back up to 240 and leave it for a little while and see what they come up to. I have the circuit here of the audio output stage and preamp drawn out from the P75 just to try and explain how it works a little bit. The HT comes in from the rectifier and goes to this tap here on the output transformer. There's a small amount of winding, not as much as the main output side which then feeds through this resistor to a second smoothing capacitor. Everything else in the set is fed from there. The DC also flows through this uh, output valve through its anode as you can see. Now the idea of this from what I understand is that effectively you have got some ripple because you've got a continuous DC current flowing through here um, because the smooth is not perfect. So the idea of this other winding and having current flowing through that, which will equally have a ripple on, is to help cancel out some of the hum coming into the speaker. Here's the output valve, and as you can see there's a cathode resistor, without bypass in this case, uh, which tends to mean the gain's a bit lower, but it's a bit more linear. There's a 1 meg resistor down to ground, to the grid. So the basic principle here is it's self-biasing, so as the current through the valve increases, cathode voltage will rise more positive. But as the grid is tied negative, um, this means as it turns on harder, the grid is pulled negative so the valve is actually turned off. So it will reach a point of equilibrium. In this case it's designed to be 5.7 volt. Obviously with a class A output stage, you're switched on at about 50% all the time. Um, so that's the basic principle of that. Um, here's the triode diode, it's got two diodes in it and a triode sharing the same cathode. Notice there's a lot more decoupling here and then you've got an anode resistor and you've got a cathode resistor again. In this case it is bypass which will increase the AC gain a little bit. Notice this coupling capacitor between the anode and the grid. Now this, if this leaks you've got problems because the DC voltage will tend to turn this valve on more and more, which will make the valve overheat, possibly damage the transformer as well, the output transformer, 
and also put the HT supply under strain so you might damage the rectifier. So you definitely don't want this capacitor to leak in any way. Looking further back here, you've got the volume control connected to the grid. This bit of circuitry here is negative feedback, so it's applying a little bit of the output back to the input. That helps reduce the distortion. Going further back, here's the final IF stage. One side is connected to the anode of the diode. The other side comes through a capacitor, through this resistor. There's the tone control which provides more smoothing. The idea of this capacitor resistor is to uh, make sure that there is no IS signal coming through this way, only audio. Also notice there's a 470k resistor here from the cathode supply which has put a certain amount of DC back into the diode. I'm assuming as this case as this diode is not used for AGC but that might be a little bit of biasing to improve the linearity of the diode so improve the sound quality. Anyway that's the, just the basics of the output stage in the P75. Just having a look at the output of the transformer and the, out and the input to the grid of the output valve which is the trace that's smaller and bleh. I have turned the feedback off so I've made it worse but even if I take the feedback off on put it back on sorry it's still pretty hideous and bleh. I'm just uh, driving the output valve directly on its grid and that's not too bad as it's starting to click there but that's a good output so I need to look at the preamp. Well that's one way to do it and that is to put a good old AVO on which is what the uh, meter readings are based on in the trader manual and it says that the anode is sitting at 42 volts. Um, Something of interest though, I noticed that this one has um, an extra resistor in it uh, connected to the cathode of the triode, um, which is a bit weird. I don't know why that's there, but I zoom in. And you can probably uh, see that extra resistor there. My tripod will stop moving. Yeah. Um, there's a one mega ohm connected to the HT or the second HT so that's obviously to pull the cathode voltage up so I'm now wondering if the voltages in the trader manual are going to be wrong because of that but I'm just wondering if this this um, triode diode is just uh, doesn't have enough emission right so I've got a little supply of uh, triode diodes to try so I'll try them in and see what happens. Okay, so my first replacement EBC41 and a similar test to what I did before. Now that's a lot better, isn't it? So there's obviously that valve I think was very, very weak emission. So again, you can see the output and the output of the triode and the output of the output valve across the loudspeaker so that's that's a lot better so that, that's good stuff I've just got my pile of bits I've removed um, just a matter of interest the capacitor is dated May 1955 in this unit right here's one of the coupling capacitors one of the waxies I've got it on 250 volts let's see what happens wow that's 100k that certainly would uh, be pushing a bit of DC through the grid and uh, now Hunt's one. Uh, this meter never quite goes down to the bottom, but uh, I've turned it down to 100 volts, and that's showing what 200k. So that one's only rated at 150 volts. I'm glad this has got a self discharger. Let's try the 0.1. What's that rated at? 300 volts, I think. I can't quite read that, but we'll stick it back up to. Uh, 250 try that one. Oh yeah that's nice and leaky ran 100k again yeah they're just total trash aren't they okay and a brand new capacitor huh, 10 giga ohms or more so uh, yeah I think that just proves how leaky these capacitors become 
I thought I'd try and explain a little bit what I'm doing when I align the radio. <clears throat> Here's the RF portion of the radio and I've simplified it by only putting in the medium wave part here. Let's find a longer stick. These are the IF transformers. What you've basically got is a um, parallel tuned circuit, a pair of them in each can, and the inductive part is very close to each other. So, the idea is, when we put a signal in here, it'll be coupled over to this side here. Now, the idea is that this tuned circuits are all tuned to the same frequency, and when they're tuned to the same frequency, it'll form a bandpass filter, in this case 470 kilohertz. The bandwidth varies on these valve radios, but let's just say it's around 5 kilohertz, which is, is typical. Uh, the earlier radios would probably be a little bit wider, but as the medium wave got crowded, they tend to, to make the bandwidth um, narrower in order to stop interference from nearby stations that are on a nearby frequency, especially at night time, where medium wave actually travels a lot further. So the idea is that I will tune the slug on each of these um, inductors in turn so that I get a response um, a centre response of 470 kilohertz. You can see there's two of them. One is in the anode of this mixer heptode and the other one is in the anode of the IF amplifier valve. Once it's been amplified up it's fed um, to the detector diode which detects the AM. All you need is a diode basically to detect AM. That's why crystal sets work as they do. I'm just setting up here to do an IF alignment. Um, I've got the um, signal generator connected via a uh, blocking capacitor to the grid of the mixer. And in this case, I've also grounded the local oscillator grid so that doesn't run. Because it's got a frame area, I'm trying to stop interference coming in. The best solution really would be to disconnect the frame area, but uh, I've taken the uh, lazy route. The idea is to adjust the slugs on the top and bottom of these two IF cans so that they're peaked at 470 kilohertz. Just having a twig of the IF at the moment. Just make sure it's on 470 as it should be. Well, I've just finished doing the IF alignment and that doesn't look too bad. It's not uh, perfect, I would say, but it's not too far out. It does look a little bit tighter one way than the other, but I oh, will give it a try, see what it sounds like. Now I'll come to the RF tuning part, which is a little bit more uh, complicated to explain, but I'll try my best. Here you can see a triode. This is the local oscillator. The purpose of this part of the circuit is to produce a local oscillator signal to feed into the mixer which is done via this grid here. This oscillator will run at a frequency from 1010 kilohertz to 2070 kilohertz. That is basically 470 kilohertz above the AM band which runs from 540 kilohertz to 1600. Now the idea is that as you tune the radio, the frequency of this oscillator will change. Now, also simultaneously, here's the RF stage part of it. This part of the circuit here has to tune from 540 to 1600. Now note that in this set, the tuning capacitor is the same level. So obviously, these inductors have to be a different value in order that, uh, that this local oscillator will run at the higher frequency but the RF input will tune the AM band. Now, so the idea is, is as you tune the radio, the local oscillator will gradually go up the AM band and also, hopefully, the frame area which forms the tuned circuit with this capacitor will tune 470 kilohertz below that simultaneously. So that's why you've got an adjuster here for the low frequency and an adjuster here for the high frequency end on the local oscillator. In the case of the RF, this trimmer here is to adjust the high frequency end, but in this case I can't adjust the low frequency end because it's fixed 
by the turns on the frame area. Now some radios have an inductor in them um, which is adjustable where they don't have a frame aerial or in the case of one with a ferret rod you will slide the uh, coil along the ferret rod to adjust the inductance. I've just come to another little bit why um, the circuit as it is. This is a super het radio. The reason you have an RF stage at the front, a tuned RF stage, is to block the image frequency. If the local oscillator is at 1100 kilohertz it's going to be sensitive to the sum and the difference. And there's two differences here. A station could be at 630 and there's a 470 difference there. And the station could be at 1570 and there's a 470 difference here. So this tuned circuit here should be tracked to the 630 station and it should reject the 1570. Now there's quite a, a wide difference in frequency between those two. And even though this is only a single RF stage, it is quite effective unless you're unlucky enough to live very close to the interfering station, in which case it would be a problem. So that's the idea of having a tuned circuit on the front of a superhet, is to reject the image frequency. Another part of the uh, circuitry I didn't explain is the automatic gain control or automatic volume control. Here you can see some of the IF signal coupled through this capacitor to another diode. That is the anode, so most positive voltage is blocked, leaving just the negative. That travels through a loading resistor and a series resistor to this capacitor. Now what happens is the larger that this signal is, the higher negative voltage will be developed across this capacitor here. Now that DC voltage is fed into the grid of the mixer and also into the grid of the IF valve. Now these valves have a characteristics where as the grid is taking negative, rather than switch off, their gain reduces. So what you have is a loop here. As the signal gets bigger, the gain of these two valves is turned down. Now that helps to keep the volume constant when you tune across various radio stations, whether they're really strong or weak. If you try turning this off and tune across the band, you'll end up getting deafened fairly quickly. Here I'm adjusting the local oscillator on the medium wave band at 600 kilohertz. I'm now adjusting the local oscillator at 1500 kilohertz, very small adjustment. So that's adjusting the tracking of the local oscillator. And the second one I adjust is the tracker across that AM or medium wave loop aerial. And that one I will adjust for maximum amplitude. Just having a look at the uh, main smoothing capacitor and I thought that's an interesting waveform. I'm guessing that uh, either my rectifier is weak on one side or there's a little bit of difference in the windings on the transformer where it's centre tapped and you've got HT on each side so that might be the reason but I might see if I've got any more rectifiers to try see if I can improve that. Well that looks a bit more symmetrical so uh, I think I'll stick, stick with that substitute. Um, so. Uh, yeah, definitely looks a little bit more even. Of course the HT's come up now, I'm struggling down at about 180 volts and it's now good 225, which is fractionally above what it states at 216, but I think I'll live with that. Another way I've found testing the RS stage is to connect the meter to the AVC voltage. Um, I'm just trying to substitute valves just to see if there's any improvement. I didn't really see much improvement changing the IF valve but I'm now going to try changing the mixer valve and see if there's an improvement in that. Well that's certainly an improvement there on the AVC voltage now, the automatic volume control voltage. So I think I'll stick with that uh, valve. It's uh, obviously a little bit more lively. Well I think I'm just about ready to put this um, back in its case now uh, with three new valves. Um, sensitivity is quite good uh, now across the band. Now I've trimmed it up as well. 
Um, transform it isolation is good, so I'm now running on a three core lead. So the chassis is earthed. So yeah, I think uh, I'm fairly happy with it now. So picks up Caroline. So that's good. Um, that's always a good sensitivity check. Kilowatt about 40 miles away. So always a good check on sensitivity. So back into the case. Well there we go, that's my uh, Pi P75 done. There's a few scratches on the case, either side where the knobs are, and a little bit of veneer at the top that's chipped, but uh, you know, <laughs> it is 70 years old, so um, it's not too bad. I've hooked up my uh, valve modulator, so we can just play something through it without copyright fear. So this will be Doug Maxwell, swing swing bada bing. <laughs> Tone minimum. Quite a nice reproduction, so I'm quite happy with that set. I've uh, also, I couldn't resist using some cotton covered PVC cable for this one. Um, does add to the look even though it did have PVC on it. Anyway, thanks for watching and uh, I'll see you soon.